Okay. okay. We should be all set. Sorry. Uh, hello and welcome everyone to this meeting of the Community Preservation Act Committee on Thursday, November 14th, 2024. I'm calling the meeting to order at 6.03 p.m. We're meeting remotely via Zoom uh, as per the decision of the town of Amherst and permitted by the state. This meeting is being recorded and will appear at a later time at the town of Amherst uh, CPA webpage. I'm going to call on people now so that we can be sure that we can all be heard and that we can hear you. My name is uh, Sam McLeod, uh, Chair. Uh, go one at a time. Robin? Uh, here. David? Here. Tim? Here. Katie? Here. Jason? Here. Bob? Here. Matt? Here. And Lawrence emailed me uh, this afternoon to indicate that he would not be attending today. So we have our full committee. Uh, as with every meeting, we need to have a minute taker. Uh, there are video recordings that one can reference. Uh, is there anyone who would like to volunteer to take minutes for this meeting? Uh, Bob, sold. <laughs> it's all on you. <clears throat> so uh, we set the agenda out earlier and Holly provided us a packet of materials for this meeting, which contained, in addition to the agenda, the information of questions and answers uh, regarding the proposals. Um, and I'll just proceed through the list. I think we'll be ahead of the curve on this meeting, uh, which I suppose is good. Uh, the first item is approval. Any outstanding minutes? There are none. So, uh, We'll go to the next item. <laughs> the next item is public comment. We have a public comment uh, session for every meeting uh, yeah. as required, and we don't want to rush them. We want to allow anyone who wishes to speak to do so. Um, I do see one attendee uh, in the audience, and if the person uh, attending would like to speak uh, to the committee, please raise your hand. I'll wait. I'll wait a moment. I don't see anybody. Um, I don't see anyone looking to speak. I'll wait uh, 30 <clears throat> seconds more. Okay. So uh, there's no public comment. I will close this portion of the meeting uh, public comment section. Now, we have scheduled meetings. We didn't know if individuals would arrive with public comments, whether or not uh, uh, there'd be any delays. So we're ahead of schedule. We really have about uh, 10 minutes or so uh, before we um, get going. I don't have anything in particular uh, to focus on. Uh, I would, I guess we can, uh, if anyone wants to bring anything up, I am going to, I did uh, solicit comments last year and feedback from committee members regarding process uh, in terms of our um, deliberations. And I did get some feedback in terms of means and things that I might be able to do as chair to kind of smooth our meetings a little quicker than in the past. Uh, I've taken note of those and hopefully this year's cycle will be uh, maybe not as uh, protracted uh, on a given topic. We'll see how that goes. We do want to be thorough. Um, <clears throat> I don't really have anything to discuss at the moment. I, I, I There is a new member here, Jason, and we're going to talk, Jason, uh, at, at the subsequent meeting uh, about how we go through the deliberations. I don't have a chart, but... I, I know that I had sent you links uh, containing previous meetings from some of our deliberation sessions, and we'll have a brief discussion on that uh, in terms of how we rate things 
first in kind of a straw poll. Uh, is there anything that uh, any committee members wish to uh, bring up? Okay. So uh, Holly, do we have any ETA for our presenters? It says 920, uh, I'm not seeing anyone. Uh, what I would do here, I guess, uh, is take a break if nobody has anything is, they wish to say. Is and... Hilda is Hilda part of the? Oops. Yeah, I I, I lost her. Yeah, I just noticed that she had pulled into the room somehow. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know, so I put her back out into the audience. I'm sorry about that. Um, there is nobody in the audience, um, besides Hilda. So the the folks that are presenting have not joined us yet. It looks like exactly. Um, so I guess um, just you know, briefly, nothing has changed in the financials yet. We have not received any of the FY24 money yet, so I don't have any new estimates. You know, again, I'm hoping by the time we vote, we will get updates. Um, we will get some money in, so I will have some more firm figures. Um, I would just encourage folks that have outstanding minutes to make sure that you forward those to Sam and I so that we can make sure that those um, get taken care of and put up onto the website. Um, so anybody with outstanding minutes from the summer or the last meeting, can you just make sure those get forwarded along? Um, no change to the financials. Same thing next week. We'll have more presentations. And um, Sam, do you recall from the draft calendar when the public hearing is going to be? Is that the first week in December? I believe it is. Uh, I've got the calendar on my desktop here, if you want to hang on just one second. I do not see anybody else in the audience yet for uh, presentations. It. We have it slated for uh, annual public hearing on Thursday, December 5th, the first meeting of December. Um, what, one thing I noticed, Holly, on the CPA webpage, uh, we need to add some agendas from our prior meetings uh, in the agenda section. The minutes have been up to date for those that we provided, and um, I can corral them, I believe, and get those to you. Um, uh, if they're agendas, I should certainly have those okay. because I need them for posting the meeting. Um, so if I missed a couple, if you can just let me know the dates, I will hunt up the agendas okay. and get them added. I'll shoot you an email. We we do have a Facebook page specific to CPA, Amherst CPA, that I just put out the meeting notices in case people want to share them. But um, if there's a committee member who would like to have access to the Facebook page and wanted to um, post, you know, information on projects, you know, photos of projects or anything, uh, I'd be glad to have another person do it. Um, it's a relatively straightforward process, uh, but you know, just keep that in mind going forward down the road. There'll need to be a transition on that aspect. So I'm going to go ahead and um, take a five minute break for everyone because I don't see any point in us uh, just hanging. Five, call it a, a seven minute break. We can get back here at 618 and uh, I'll see you all then.
So we're waiting for a few folks to come back. Uh, <clears throat> I do see that Greg is uh, in the audience who's presenting this next uh, session. I'd like to invite Greg to be a panelist. I've just sent an invitation. Hi, Greg. Can you hear us? Sure. Hi, and I am joined tonight. Uh, I can't actually see the audience, but I um, have Gaston de los Reyes, who's the chair of the Housing Trust. Yeah, I um, can promote Gaston as well, if that uh, works for you. Please. And uh, let's give it a minute. I had committee members take a brief break. Uh, we're... I guess we can proceed without Holly, but uh, let's see if she returns. We'll start on the regular schedule. Oh. Oh, and I just got a quick sound distraction. Hi. I'm going to turn off. Okay. Have a minute. Okay. And I wonder when it's our uh, chance to say a few words, if I could present uh, a couple slides. Uh, certainly, if we're able to make that work, it looks like actually it looks like I have the button to do so. So I'm actually all set. That would be fine. So uh, we might as well commence now. Uh, our uh, full committee is here. Short one individual. Uh, we did receive previously responses to the questions that we had sent in. Thank you. Uh, this is a meeting where we provide you the opportunity to speak, and then committee members may or may not have questions. And later on, uh, December 5th, there'll be a public hearing and then our committee will deliberate further. So the floor is yours, uh, Greg and Gaston. Uh, Thank you so, so, so much uh, for, for your time. I want to spend just a minute introducing the committee to you perhaps once more. Um, I, I'm an attorney, so I'd like to start with chapter and verse and just show you that this uh, housing trust was created to you know, in the first instance, be able to receive funds and to be able to receive funds through the CPA committee. So that's fundamental to uh, who we are. Uh, there are numerous of, of safeguards that are provided by statute to make sure that those funds are used appropriately. I, I won't go into them, but you can see uh, those conditions spelled out um, in, in the statute. And with those funds, we are poised to uh, invest in real property and engage in a number of transactions, all with the goal of promoting affordable housing in Amherst. Uh, we have just spent the full year guided by uh, someone coming from the state to help our housing trust develop its strategy. And we recently adopted that strategy a, a few weeks ago. Uh, number one prong of that strategy, I'm just giving you the headlines, is to support the creation of 200 or more homes in the next five years. Fundamental to achieving that goal is our second uh, important goal, which is to secure $4 million over this period of time to be able to uh, advance this development goal. And third, I'll mention that we are committed to public engagement, educating the community and supporting affordable housing from multiple uh, points of view. Uh, you may know that the Housing Trust in Amherst is really a, a creation and, and uh, uh, labor of love of John Hornick who uh, stepped down as chair after many years in helping start the trust fund. And uh, since that time, uh, uh, we have been led by Erica Piedade and Carol Lewis. Um, uh, Erica is uh, uh, involved in public health, Carol Lewis, uh, nonprofits, both in the community for many decades. Um, they stepped down as chair and I uh, became chair in that period of time. Before I joined, we were lucky to get uh, the assistance of, of Greg who uh, brings his own decades of career in nonprofits supporting uh, community engagement and housing in particular. So uh, we're uh, very fortunate to have his uh, support. The, the board also includes Rob Crowner, who um, is also a board member of the Community Land Trust. Uh, Allegra Clark, who graduated from the high schools in town is chair of the Amherst Community Safety and so Social Justice Committee. And Grover Wayman Brown, who brings her PhD in communication to supporting nonprofits in social justice and housing in particular. 
And uh, I'm a business school professor and, and very pleased to be able to serve the community in this way. I'll, I'll hand it over now to Greg to tell you about some of the projects that we've been supporting and our vision going forward. Thank you. There's the mute. Uh, as we noted uh, in our response to your questions, um, our, we're, we're kind of one of the specialties that seems to be emerging for the trust is to be really timely um, and uh, and nimble and responsive in our funding practices. Um, you're looking here at uh, 132 Northampton Road, which is a project by Valley Community Development. Um, that uh, you know was a, a you know a really exciting project from the start. Um, we had a lot of challenges uh, as far as uh, you know, the, the public process, but we were, the outcome, uh, I think most agree has been really fantastic. Um, you know, so when that project was getting close to construction, after, well after it was permitted, um, uh, a funding gap emerged rather quickly, um, and we were able to act uh, quite rapidly as the trust um, to uh, get them about $100,000 and unlock significantly more state funds um, to keep that project on track. And now you're looking at it uh, here and complete and occupied successfully. Um, we uh, filled a similar gap more recently um, also for Valley Community Development in the upcoming Amherst Community Homes Development, um, which will be uh, 28 duplexes for home ownership up in North Amherst. We play a similar role there in, in filling a gap, um, which is a key role that we do. Um, so we can advance that, Gaston, if you could. Um, so, you know, looking forward as far as, you know, what's happening and what's directly on our plates, um, we anticipate uh, that the VFW site, which is intended for redevelopment into a permanent site for shelter as well as supportive housing, which is a very exciting project, uh, will be coming down the pipeline in, in some fashion or in other before the trust. Um, it's an exciting project, but we know already it will be a very complex project and in a lot of ways, much more complex than anything Amherst has done before. Uh, we're up for it, but it means that likely there will be there will need to be a a fairly extended period of pre-development where various parties have to coordinate with each other, figure out a plan, you know, you know, do, do, even before we get to design, it's, it's more about uh, just, you know, the, the various parties and their relationship to each other. So that's a fairly extended pre-development period, um, which would require resources and the trust could absolutely support that uh, effectively, uh, you know, with, you know, with support from the CPA. Um, so that's kind of one uh, kind of thing that's immediately before us. But then if we kind of look up toward the horizon a little higher, uh, you know, the context right now statewide is the Affordable Homes Act, which just got passed, uh, certainly with a lot of support from the trust and lots of folks in Amherst. Um, it's important that we're as a community ready um, to act on those resources as they come down the pipe. Um, so as uh, and, and the way the, the best way to act on those resources is to have local uh, not matching dollars because they're much more substantial than we would put in, but you know, local seed money um, to get these developments going. Um, developers in turn are going to to migrate to the communities um, that have that seed money, so they in turn can access these much larger funds from the state. Um, other possibilities, directions we could go in, um, sort of you know, acquisition of a property. We we could help uh, a developer or or other entity, um, you know, acquire or preserve affordability in a property. Um, we could uh, try some more creative stuff, um, incentivizing homeowners uh, to do um, affordable stuff in their on their own lots. Um, you know, there's some cool emergent stuff happening ar around that, uh, really nationwide, and we could we could potentially give it a swing. Um, um, a, a more basic idea uh, for uh, you know, but also creative and useful would be um, like a revolving pre-development. Uh, program uh, over, or uh, basically a revolving loan fund, which would be local to Amherst. Um, there's um, a great track record of, track record of that uh, in Somerville, also more locally uh, right in Northampton. Um, but that's a, a, an, an approach where, you know, funds, you know, get put uh, into a developer, you know, while they're scoping something. And then when construction financing comes through, it gets paid back. Um, and that can really help, you um, uh, you know, sort of magnified dollars in a, a really efficient way. So, you know, these are kind of conceptual ideas, you know, but just to give an idea of the scope of, you know, where the trust could go um, in the, you know, the, the, the slightly more distant future. Uh, but I think um, with that, um, I think that's kind of the, the, the main basic concepts we wanted to impart tonight, um, but we would be happy to answer any questions or help clarify anything or tell you more about the trust if we could. Uh, thank you, Greg, uh, and thank you, Gaston, for uh, providing information and uh, 
introductions as well. Uh, it's nice to see the full name of the committee members who's associated with the trust. Uh, and I'd like to open up the uh, meeting to questions or comments from CPA committee members. Um, I see, Bob, uh, that you have your hand up. I'd like to call on you. Um, I'm just, I'm curious that a revolving loan fund hasn't been explored before. Are there barriers to that? Are there structural and legal and regulatory barriers to make that hard to implement? Um, there are probably some some like legal barriers in the sense of, you know, having to, you know, figure out the, how we do it. And then we, there would probably need to be some sort of financial partner, like a bank or something, uh, or there's also nonprofit entities that might do that sort of thing. Um, uh, you know, and it's, um, um, you know, I, but there's not major barriers yeah. to it. No, it, it would take some input for sure. Um, and I'll just jump in here. I mean, it's certainly within the powers of the trust and we have other communities doing it. And uh, it would be a, a, a nice challenge. My um, Before I was a PhD, I was a deal lawyer um, in New York. So I would be happy to f help us figure out how to put the pieces together. And as you know, we're well supported in town uh, by town council. Yeah. It's, in, in fact, also uh, one of our trust members uh, for his day job, Rob Crowner, uh, works for the Equity Trust and runs a revolving loan, uh, I think, which is a statewide or national entity, I believe. But yeah. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Bob. Uh, Matt? Hi. Um, so we've we've heard this uh, from you, not from you two, but from the trust the previous two years I've been on the committee and it sounds good everything you're saying. Um, and I like what you're saying this time specifically. Um, I'm a bit curious. So you said 4 million for 200 homes, that comes out to 20,000 a home, but that's probably less than, do you think you can get that done? I mean, previously we've seen at least 50,000 per home. Maybe I'll take just a, a first pass here, and then and then the um, second the yeah. second the second part of the question yeah. is you said four million in five years that's eight hundred thousand a year, but you're asking us for five hundred thousand. Is there an additional source of funds to get to the four million in five years? Uh, let, let me take a first pass, if I may, Greg. So, on, yeah, uh, to, to to the first question, and you know these are uh, our ambitions, their reach goals. And our plan is not to, uh, you know, unlock a home with a proportional amount of those of those funds. And so there's going to be a variety of of opportunities that come up that have different dollar per unit. And uh, so we are, um, you know, open to whatever it is that that we see and can develop. Um, uh, on the second point, I didn't provide you the sub points on the strategy, which includes accessing funds not only through the CPA, uh, but also by going to the schools like Amherst College um, and, and other uh, sources. So we are going to be um, uh, open-minded about where we uh, uh, find the funds that we are seeking to provide the foundation to this very ambitious goal. Thank you. Uh, Jason. Thank you. Could you explain the partnership with uh, the trust and developers? And are any of these developers for-profit companies? And the relationship between the money that's provided through the trust and taxes here, and then the potential profit that these companies make? That is a good question. Um, I'm just pausing here to be extra sure. To date, um, we have not partnered with uh, a for-profit development entity. Um, I, I don't believe it is expressly prohibited in the statute or, or bylaws, um, but it that kind of partnership is, is, is probably less likely, I'd say. Um, you know, there are scenarios where, you know, if it resulted in, you know, deed-restricted affordable housing that... You know, that was a priority, you know, for members of the trust in the community where perhaps it, it, it might be pursued. But but of the people building affordable homes in Massachusetts, you know, it's it's less likely that there'd be a partnership like that. 
the developers in the space are are nonprofits, yeah. um, Correct. and yeah. the, their economics depend on their uh, p- opportunity of getting the tax credits that are conditioned on on their status in uh, as a general rule. Yeah, I mean, and it, it is the case that that technically, that like especially in other parts of the country, you do see for profit companies um, uh, using the low income housing tax credit. Um, it's it's far less common in Massachusetts for a variety of reasons, but um, and, and there's many filters, including us, on that. Has there been any conversation about potentially partnering with for profit entities to build? You know, uh, and this is just kind of not talking out loud, but. You know, there's there's a need for housing, market rate housing, affordable housing uh, throughout the town. If the trust is acquiring land, has there any been conversation about acquiring larger plots of land potentially and building a mix of market rate and affordable housing? Certainly, I mean, it's something like that. You know, if 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 there was a possibility of you know of, of that kind of a scenario where, you know, where where we had the resources and we thought the the proposed development met our goals. I, you know, I think there'd be consideration of that. And, and one sure. of the, you know, again, but, but, yeah. oh, sorry, the, one of the sub points on the development strategy is to seek land um, and, and land donations, whether through the universities or the town uh, or, or in any other way that we can think of. Uh, Matt. Yeah, I guess just, uh, riffing off Jason a little bit I guess maybe Jason's question is well made me think of for example mixed-use developments in town which do have affordable housing which may have affordable housing as a requirement of the zoning requirements but I don't think the trust is necessarily involved in that type of project so much the trust gets more involved in projects where the developer is going to seek state and federal funds to support the development of the house and um, they need local matching funds to to go in that direction so i don't know what role the trust has in that that first regular developer where there's a zoning requirement causing them to have the things i don't know that the trust has been involved in that in the past not on the front end no i mean so uh, no we we don't get involved with with like inclusionary requirements is what we call them in the zoning sense. So that's um, in many of the developments, many of the market rate developments you see do have that obligation to include, uh, you know, a percentage of uh, affordable units, but, but that's subsidized entirely by the, the market rate developer um, and outside the scope of the trust. So, you know, the, you know, there's on the, on the back end, uh, you know, there's one developer recently that's um, gone a different route, but um yeah. And you know, separate from our development work, as part of our community engagement work, we would be supporters, let's say, before the ZBA of uh, any plan to increase housing, whether it's um, you know market rate with some uh, uh, you know affordable housing. We are for for housing, and so we might use our voice to be supportive of um, uh, measures that would expand housing in the in the town. Um, I have a question. Can you provide an update on the the current funding, the balances approximate that the uh, trust has? You in your application provided a a chart uh, delineating the general balance and the balance from CPA. At the time in July, it was five hundred some odd thousand, I believe, of uh, current. CPA development funds, 564. Uh, what's the status in of just the general prior awards from CPA towards the trust, as well as your current financial situation? Sure. So um, I, you know, I actually should have that in front of you. I don't at the moment, but the, um, and, and I will certainly follow up with the precise numbers. Um, I have but a chart we, from July 9th that, if you want that one, but I don't know if that's what you need. Yeah, I mean that that it hasn't changed m- much since then because that there's probably a note in that document which which includes um, a subtraction of, uh, of 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 an allocation we've already voted for. So the current balance, if you count 
for um, commitments we've already made uh, is around $178,000, I, I believe, right, right around there. Um, the document that you got in the original application may have had a balance because the money probably is still technically in the town account because that developer hasn't called on it yet. Um, uh, but whatever the accounting stream is, um, it, you know, the, the, the trust vote has been made just that the, the check hasn't been written yet, essentially. Yeah. So subtracting that's around 78. If, if there is an update, I think it might be helpful just to provide uh, the committee uh, the current details, uh, whatever they might be in terms of the, uh, if there's any change to what you had submitted with your application. Um, I guess another question that I had uh, is a lot of different projects, trust us a lot of things. Uh, the CPA has funded different items, whether it be the um, old BFW building, the Gables, East Gables, as well as the Wayfinders projects on Southeast Street. Um, is there one, any one of these that new projects or existing projects that you would say is the most imminent or likely to require funds or would this all be seed money for future projects if you know if i had to guess i think it would probably be a mix of both um i you know i, I certainly among um I, you know i think the two that uh you know certainly are fundable in the near term uh would be the vfw site which would um you know, sort of be partnering with the town, you know, it, it, so there has to be an RFP process for that site. Um, but it's likely that uh, one healthy way to go at that might be to pair some initial pre-development resources, you know, with with the RFP picture so that a respondent kind of knows what they're responding to. Um, and then um, I, I'd say it's fairly likely we'll get a request from, from Wayfinders, um, but we, we haven't uh, uh, Heard of that sense? That's not built yet. Um, and then I think beyond that, it would be uh, it, it would be new stuff that's not kind of on any official radar yet. Thank you, uh, Jason. Yeah, can you uh, could you clarify when you say that you're expecting to get a request from Wayfinders? What exactly is it that they're requesting from you? I assume it's money, but what is it for? And how many of those requests generally do you get? That's my first question. And my second question is, in, through all of your funding streams, do you receive any federal funding or do you or do, do the groups that you work for receive any federal or work with receive federal funding? And has there been any discussion about the potential for a lack of federal funding in the next year or two or potentially four? Sure. Um, so yeah, so the requests, the number of requests are somewhat, um, it's, it's a little unpredictable. It's kind of the nature of it. Um, but the, you know, but, you know, and it's hard to speak to, you know, and I, you know, you know, I, I, Wayfinders is, um, likely to soon receive, um, local, uh, you know, zoning and, and basically their comprehensive permit. And so the way, the way nonprofit affordable housing developers work is they, they, they get their, um, their land use approvals, you know, from a community. Um, and then um, they go um, and seek additional funds, seek a major part of their funding often from the state. Um, and then, um, uh, and then sometimes additional resources from, from local partners. Um, you know, they'll often have like letters of, Sort of informal commitments from state agencies um, uh, that happen uh, at the front end of their process, and then they they try and go and, and lock those in and actually get in the formal queue. Sometimes um, inflation pressures between those two times um, create gaps, and that's kind of where we've stepped in in the past. Um, so you know we'll get um, you know between one and four of those a year. You know probably 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 one or two um, of uh, you know as far as those projects that are already in the pipeline. Um, you know, and so they're, uh, but, but, you know, often what they're doing is saying, you know, they'll come to us and they'll say like with Amherst Community Homes is, um, you know, is entitled and, you know, we'll start construction in the spring. And basically what happened there is, you know, just the timing was poor as far as when they launched that project and when they got to the funding juncture 
and uh, the, the the inflation between those two points um, was pretty severe. So the state said, get some local resources, uh, some additional local resources, and we'll match that with the state market contingency funds. So I think we, um, I think we put in an additional three hundred thousand dollars, and they're getting at least four seventy five in market contingency funds from the state. And that's actually a pretty low leverage thing, lower than we would normally do, but but it's going to keep the project on track and, and get it done. Um, so it, it often the requests that we get for these projects that are already happening is to uh, it, it, recently to address inflation and also to to unlock additional state funds. Um, as to federal funding, um, uh, so we don't receive directly federal funds. Um, you know, our partner developer organizations do um, not not in a uh, not in a direct equity fashion though. So um, a big part of how we fund these projects is with the federal and state, but also the federal low income housing tax credit, um, which uh, is a sort of a complex thing. But the, the advantage of that is it's it's a little harder to eliminate. There are major uh, you know you know banks and large financial entities nationally that are very vested in it. Um, and uh, if we expect a juiced economy, um, you know, then tax credits work well, uh, you know, at least better than they do when the economy is poor. Um, so I, I, I wouldn't worry about those so much. Where concerns emerge possibly is with vouchers. Um, you know, uh, some of these developments will, uh, will, they'll get, you know, sort of, you know, equity from tax credits and state funding and, and local sources like us. Um, but then for the often for the very low or extremely low income units at like 30 percent of area median income, often these will be subsidized by um, by different state or federal vouchers. Those federal vouchers, you know, uh, are, um, you know, perhaps there's a vulnerability there, I'd say. But it's really unpredictable. Is that it's really the you know I mean th there there's certain things that could work better honestly uh, and you know and and there's there's other things that could be vulnerable. Uh, thank you, Greg. Uh, if there's any brief questions, we're getting close to the time to uh, wrap up. We we of course can always ask further questions and send them to the applicants. Uh, Bob, I do see that your hand is raised. I'd like to call yeah, on you. Yeah, Ben, and if this goes off on a tangent, please feel to cut it off. Um, the VFW project, you're saying that's sort of the most immediate need. And when you show me that picture, I can see the complication embedded in it. Is there any other low-hanging fruit that you've considered instead of diving into a long, complicated project and maybe go for something easier? Sure. So, you know, here it's, I think, useful to delineate between, you know, like overall town initiatives and then, then the ways that the trust uh, might support those initiatives. So the VFW is, is ultimately an initiative that I guess came from the council in that um uh, not sure who the ultimate allocating body for ARPA funds was, but the sort of inciting event was the town purchasing that site for, um, uh, you know, for that intended purpose, um, which the trust was not involved with that with that purchase. That was ARPA money that did that. But to move forward, um, I, I think it you know it, it would be appropriate for us to, um, you know, to to play a role. And to be clear, the trust itself won't be the entity kind of coordinating the plan, but the scenario that might emerge is, you know, uh, somebody responds to an RFP, um, but needs some time to figure out, you know, how can I get the services? Are those vouchers going to be secure? Can I get them from the state? You know, you know, and, and, and those kind of things for, uh, you know, and then also balancing building shelter with supportive housing. These things complement each other financially, but um, it's just a, a, a trickier plan to make than just building apartments, uh, you know, because uh, there's there's some complex services on the back end, and you have to have a plan for that on the front end. So we won't be designing those services. There, presumably, there would be external partners that want an RFP, uh, but uh, we could support their efforts to do that with, uh, you know, comparably modest pre-development funds to what the actual uh, thing will cost. And, and if I may follow up, you know, historically the trust has typically responded to developers and other applicants for our funds. 
we are excited by the influence of this affordable housing law at the state level that really opens the, the, the gates to ADUs. And so we would, for example, like to explore how we may be able to support the development of, of ADUs in town. And, and that might be through revolving credit. It may be through uh, some form of grants that, that, that help uh, make those projects affordable. Thank you. Unless there's any particular uh, further immediate question, um, I think we can follow up with you if we have others. And also, if there's something you'd like to share with our committee, please send it to Holly and myself. Uh, thank you for what you do for the community, and thank you for taking the time to be here and uh, uh, let us know about your work and your, your thoughts. Thank you very much for your time. Thank, Thank you all for your time and efforts. So, Holly, do we see the next presenter here? Hmm. Stay uh, with me. Uh, sorry, my apologies. I am having technical difficulties tonight for sure. Um, uh, who is the next? Which project is next? Oh. The the uh, schedule I'm looking at has the Amherst Historical Commission, uh, and the applicant was Madeline Helmer, I believe. Uh, the subsequent proposal was the uh, Jewish Community Association Historic Preservations of Stained Glass Windows, uh, and that uh, presenter is in the audience, even though it's prior to the slated time. Um, maybe we uh, switch the order here and allow Karen to present if she's ready. Um, I have a thought, uh, Holly, perhaps you could, while they're presenting, you or I could seek to uh, reach out to Madeline of the uh, Historical Commission, to, Historical Commission to see if they, uh, if she's available. So I'm not sure, I didn't hear anything. Um, so let's, uh, allow Karen to speak and see uh, if this works for her. Hello. And, and would you like, I'm sorry, I apologize, Karen. Would you like me to try and see if I can contact? Uh, I probably only have an email address. I do may yes. not have direct. Okay. Yeah, that would be helpful. Just uh, this is their time slot. We could always fit them in later, but uh, this was what was listed. I don't know uh, what the status is. So, but uh so, uh, Karen, um, we're about 10 minutes early from your regular uh, presentation time. Are you able to commence at this point? Yeah, I can get started. Let me uh, promote you to a panelist here, and hopefully we'll be able to see you in a moment. Wonderful. Um, uh, can you hear us now, Karen? I can, yes. Okay. So we're ready when you are. Uh if you'd like to okay. uh just um I, I made a little like uh thing. So let me share my screen. Hi everybody. Hi. Um Hi. so I'm Karen Rhodes. I'm um, the executive director of the Jewish community of Amherst. Um we're not a Jewish community center, we are a synagogue. Um our name just doesn't sound like it always. Um so um, the big picture is that we have seven historic stained glass windows that were installed over a hundred years ago. Um, and the cost of restoration is estimated to be about 210,000. That's what we're asking for today. And the restoration will preserve an important historical piece of the town. Um, so just to show you what we're talking about, this is our sanctuary. And I picked pictures with people because I wanted you to see just how close people are sitting to the windows all the time. Um, this is part of the urgency. Um, here's another one. There are children. They sit right up against the windows. There's not a way for us to really block off the window area without significantly impacting our seating capacity in our main sanctuary. And then this is just like a few snapshots of what's going on with the windows. You can see that there's cracking. This one's showing, if you can tell, it's like it's a uh, warped, the, the glass is warped. Um, this will come up later, these, these bars that go across the 
window that have the ties tying the lead to them. That was something that was added in. We think about 30 or 40 years ago to help reinforce the windows and buy more time before they needed to be um, renovated and uh, or restored. And then you can see some of the like caulking stuff's coming out. So that's just like a sampling of what's going on um, right up close to next to where the kids sit. <laughs> So our building used to be the second congregational church of Amherst, and we purchased it in 1976. When we bought it, the when the second congregational church was winding down, it was really important to them that their building not become, uh, according to the lore, quote unquote, a dance hall or offices. They really wanted it to be maintained as a sacred space. So when the Jewish community was looking for a, a building to buy, it was sort of a, a good match um, because Part of what we were going to do is maintain it as a sacred space. We've since renovated some of it, um, adding additional. There's an addition that was done in about 2000 with um, a social hall, a kitchen, and a small sanctuary in the main offices. But the pledge that we made to them when we bought the building is something that the community has taken really seriously over the last, um, you know, 50 years. Um, and the JCA wanted has has invested quite a bit of time and energy and money in ensuring that the the building is preserved. Um, we come to the stained glass windows because we were updating all of our insurance, and our agent asked for a new evaluation of the of the value of the windows so that we would make sure they were properly insured. And the person that we came in we had come in to do that identified that they were in like urgent need that we hadn't realized it was so urgent. Um, of restoration, like he was like, don't touch them anymore because they're at imminent risk of complete collapse and then you can't really put them back together. Um, each window has an etched glass memorial inscription. Some of these names should sound familiar to those of you who have lived in Amherst for parts of your life. Um, my understanding is that Deacon Justice Hawley was a fairly important person. I haven't fully done the research, but in the um, cemetery, he has like a really big monument to him. Um, the Woodworth family, the Dickinson family, obviously, we don't know if Emily Dickinson ever came in the building, but we know that parts of her family were, um, were a church, attended church, and then the Hastings family. Um, so we had an expert in uh, stained glass come in after we had that original, um, what was supposed to just be an insurance evaluation <laughs> done. Um, and so this is um, Dr. Virginia Ragwin, and I'm, I'll let you read. She's uh, very qualified and we brought her in because she wasn't trying to sell us something, right? Like she wasn't trying to sell us her services. She just came in to evaluate the, the state of the windows and she concurred with most of what the guy said. Um, so her conclusions, hold on, I got to make you little so I can see. Um, so basically um, the windows have been there about 130 years. They're past their lifespan. There's bowing and distortion and, um, and they even have been like, they tried to do a little bit of like upkeep, but it's it's past the point where that can be done. They really need to be taken out completely, completely re-leaded and put back in. Um, so her recommendation was for us to do that. Um, it's hard, the, the, the tricky piece is that it's hard to know exactly what it's gonna cost until they get them out and into the studio. Um, but we have now, the insurance thing happened at the end of August. She came in in September. And so it's all very short notice. But because of the urgency, we decided not to wait another year to apply for CPA funds next year and get all the quotes. And we decided to just apply. Um, but we've since had two more quotes done that both came out um, to 10 or above. So, so it's a pretty accurate guess as to what it's going to cost to the best of the, and every single one of them has a qualifier. But until I get it into the studio, I can't tell you for sure. Um, so that's, that was my presentation. Um, I'm happy to answer questions. I know one of the questions that you had sent me was, can we do them one at a time? Um, and the answer is we could, but one, there's an economy of scale. So, um, all, both studios that we've talked to, and actually I've talked to two more, but they haven't come out to do, um, the estimates yet. Um, the, it, there's some costs, some administrative costs and travel costs, because all these studios are fairly far away three, four, six hours. Um, every time they come out, they have to charge us, like it costs the same to send a truck out and a person to, 
you know, carefully take the window out and pack it and bring it back to the studio. So there's some cost savings, although it's hard to quantify, but in the thousands of dollars for doing it all at once. Um, and then the other mm -hmm. issue is you saw how close the people sit to the window. So if we do them one at a time, we're just increasing the risk that somebody's going to like bump an elbow into a window between now and when we get to it. And, and then I don't think it's like restorable at that point, if it completely collapses. Um, Matt. Thanks, Karen, um, for the presentation. And clearly you're on the ball if you only found out about this three months ago and uh, three or four <laughs> months ago. Uh, we're already we're already here talking about it. So um, I just have uh, I appreciate the the JCA has really uh, been a good steward of the of the building there. What can you tell me? What is your sort of annual maintenance budget? And then second question, I think it was in the original proposal. Um, how many, what what other funds have you asked for previously from the CPA over the years? Yeah, so the only other, I'll go backwards. The only other funds we've asked the CPA for were, I don't know exactly the year. It was like six or seven years ago now. Um, the steeple was struck by lightning and um, it became prohibitive to repair it on our own. And so we... Um, applied and received some CPA money for that. We paid about 20% of the costs. The CPA money covered the rest. And um, actually the last of that money is still, needs, we still need to like sign the final thing and it takes a long time. Um, uh, our annual maintenance budget uh, varies, but in the last few years, we have been spending somewhere between 30 and $40,000 a year on um, like we're just doing redoing the roof over the library. We've redone the gutters recently, some landscaping. Um, the JCA went through a few years of pretty rough financial situation. Um, we're on much better footing, but it means that there is some backlog of uh, maintenance. And I'm, well, I've only been the executive director for two years. Um, and uh, I'm trying really hard to get caught up on everything. Um, uh, and we do have a building fund. We do have some funds, but this would sort of the roof is leaking and we need to do the windows and you know the cheapest thing for us to do would be to replace the windows with just like plain windows but we don't want to do that i actually think we're not allowed to do that according to the town we have to keep the the original stained glass windows so we need help to make that happen um robin hi i have a couple of questions um the first one is that in your proposal you um said that you would conduct fundraising if the costs exceeded what your current ask is. And then there was another line in there that said you'd budgeted $35,000 in the we capital have. budget. So we have, yeah. Over it. So I'm trying to understand the difference between those two. And if there might be some of that applied to this amount to offset yeah. uh, if it comes in at budget. So there's some assumption that there's going to be some overage because they're just trying to guess. It's unlikely to come out less and may come out more once they get it into the studio. So we're prepared to, to we, we we have set aside from our building fund $35,000 that will help cover the overage. I think the idea of the fundraising is if the CPA is not able to give us the full amount that we need or the gap between what we get from CPA and our 35,000 leaves a gap. We will attempt to do fundraising, whether we'll be successful or not, I don't know. Um, we just did a major capital campaign before we knew the windows were an issue um, because we, we are in the middle of installing a solar canopy in our parking lot and converting our entire building over to electric heat pumps. Um, that came about also the addition was put in 20 years ago. That's when all of the HVAC systems were put in. They were past the end of their life and starting to go one at a time. And we decided instead of replacing them all on an emergency basis to do a concerted effort to both get all of our HVAC up to modern standards and put the solar in to help us with costs. So it wasn't really an option to not do the HVAC. And that was like no heat in the winter kind of a situation. But the sense is that like right in this moment in time, we've exhausted our ability to fundraise from our community because we just raised a lot of money. Um, so had we known the, gla the glass was an issue, the windows had been on my agenda, but I just thought like I could look at them next year, you know, there's only so much I can do in two years. Um, um, but um, so so I think that we would try and, and if, you know, if, if we have to go talk to Amherst College, if we have to talk to the Lumley Dickinson Museum, like we will, I just, those aren't guaranteed sources. 
we can try. Sure. Okay. And then um, a second question was, I know that you definitely wouldn't want to do the windows one by one. That would be crazy. But, um, you know, would it be conceivable to split it into like two phases? It would be. I mean, and I realize that there's not a cost savings, but in terms of, you know, if CPA. Yeah. Like, I'm just uh, worried about the damage that can be done in the interim. Mm -hmm. um, because of the way our building is used, we would be able to move fairly quickly and just do it this coming summer. The there's a lot of usage during the year. And then June, July, August, there's almost nothing going on. So it's not a big deal to have the windows boarded up. There's no bar mitzvahs, there's no weddings, there's no generally. Um, and um, so if we did it in two phases, it would be like summer 2025 and summer 2026. And between now and summer 2026 is a long time for somebody to accidentally bump into one of them. When you know the pictures I showed you were what we would consider medium attendance events for the high holidays, we have twice as many people in there. And they're like shoulder to shoulder and okay. someone's going to lean on a window. Like, just you, like big signs that say like, don't touch these. They're in high risk of collapse. Have you had an incident where one of them has been damaged recently or? No, but I think that some of the ones where you see the fine cracking, that's probably from somebody bumping up against it. Um, so okay. it, it always happen. Great. Thank you. I believe Jason, you were next. Thank you. Um, Karen, as part of the <clears throat> potential restoration of these windows, you mentioned several times people bumping into them. Uh, do you have any plans to protect them then? If they are restored, how are you going to prevent that in the future so that you don't get a nice, beautiful, newly restored window know. that then someone bumps into? That's what insurance is for. Um, but also, um, so it's not just the bumping. They are openable like people were opening and closing them because there wasn't air conditioning in the sanctuary. Now we have air conditioning in the sanctuary. So one of the recommendations has been to install them in a fixed fashion where they can no longer be opened and closed to minimize the, the um, movement. And then, yes, we are talking to the experts about what there might be that we could put in that won't disrupt the way they look. And, and that's part of the, like, we just haven't had time to fully explore those options because this has been on a fast track timeline. Sure. Do you think you could put something like, uh, you know, a clear plexiglass seated so, in, in the cells? Yeah. I don't know. So um, there's clear plexiglass on the outside to protect from like rocks and branches and like if there's a hurricane. And actually, because that's there, it's actually contributed. This is what Virginia was explaining, contributed to the degradation of the windows because there's not airflow. And she had suggested like a different type of installation to make sure that there's proper airflow. So there are, it's complicated is what is the, is the answer I've gotten. And once we actually pick a studio after we get all the quotes, then we have to explore with them what the best options are. But we don't want to just, if you just seal it in in plastic, it actually is not good for the window. So it's trying to figure out a balance. Is that, is the exploration of you know, the future preservation of these windows by protecting them part of this $210,000, or is that going to be an additional cost and additional services? That would be additional. Uh, Tim. Okay. Uh, my initial question was going to be about the fundraising. Seems to me this is a prime fundraising opportunity. There might be someone who's very interested in helping restore those windows. So any efforts in that direction, I think, would be well uh, undertaken. My comment, though, is uh, last week my wife sings in the Leverett Community Chorus, and they used the sanctuary for their concert, which was packed. And I sat right next to one of those windows. <laughs> and indeed, the photos are correct. Uh, they're beautiful windows, but they are in really tough shape. So yeah. I would definitely support the uh, restoration and renovation of the windows. Thank you. And actually, that's a great point is even though we're a synagogue and its primary use is for our services, we do have quite a, you know, quite a few, a decent number of outside organizations because it's a really great spot for concerts for we've had piano concerts, we've had organ concerts, we've had several choruses that perform there. Um, so once people re think of us, then they call and we don't charge very much of anything at all because we're a part of the community um, and we want to maintain that beautiful space for that. Um, I have a question for you, Karen, uh, sure. regarding the the windows themselves and any images that 
might be displayed on them. As I looked at the presentation uh, and the application photos, what I saw was beautiful windows, color designs, uh, and uh, some names on the bottom. Are there any uh, more specific details, references related to them? Uh, they seem as though uh, they're beautiful windows. They seem that they could fit in well in any location, not necessarily uh, a synagogue or a church. They, yeah. they so there's... seem to have the appearance of being distinctly, uh, I'll use the word religious, uh, Yeah. As a stretch. Yeah. So there's no religious iconography in any of them. And that's part of what made it appealing to the Jewish community of Amherst that they could keep the windows because we wouldn't have like crosses and Jesus staring down at us while we pray. Um, and it's just a geometric design that's apparently, according to Virginia, like typical of the time. Um, and, you know, it's kind of cool when I, I, I'm also the director of education and like we bring the kids in there and we're like, they all like, you know, Dickinson, Emily Dickinson, because every kid in every school in Amherst has read a million Emily Dickinson poems. And we're like, yeah, we don't know if she was ever here because she didn't leave her house. But yes, like they feel more connected to the building and the place and to Amherst because of those windows. It's, it's good to hear your response from my perspective, as I'm aware of some of the state um, requirements relating to the use of CP, CPA funds for varying buildings and endeavors um that's what i thought but thank you for confirming that yeah you're um, welcome i know that when the um steeple when we applied for the steeple that came up as well and the um point that we made that was accepted was that the steeple it doesn't have any meaning from a jewish perspective it's we're only maintaining it for its historic value if it was up to us it was leading got hit by lightning but it was much cheaper to just take it down um, but but our commitment to keeping the building in its historic original condition um, is what motivated repairing it as opposed to removing it. Uh, thank you. Um, other questions from committee members, questions or comments? We may have further questions uh, for you, Karen, or uh, in separately, if there's anything additional that you'd like to provide the committee, of course, please do so. Um, there will be, at a later point in time, a public hearing, uh, for, which is required by the state to allow the public uh, an annual meeting to comment on any of the proposals. And thereafter, our committee will commence deliberations. Um, so I, I, is there anything you'd any final word you'd like to share with us? We are hoping to make the windows more available to the public. And again, the short time frame and where the Jewish high holidays fell have sort of curtailed my efforts, but I'm hoping to be reaching out to the Emily Dickinson Museum and asking them if there's some way we can collaborate with them, whether to include information on their website, get better photos, um, you know, or make it known that our building is available during business hours for people to walk in and see them. We also have one of the, a gallery that used to be on the gallery walk back when that was a thing in town, the Thursday night, arts night, where the trolley took your, anyways, we have in the gallery, people can just walk in and see, and we would really like to make the windows once they're all restored and beautiful, um, available to the public as well in some way. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate uh, your presentation. Uh, clarity of responses. I'm sure our committee, the full committee does, as well as your flexibility in uh, starting okay. to present earlier, which is, you know, it, it takes some doing sometimes when one is planning uh, to be in front of an audience to suddenly have your slated time appear earlier than expected. So thank you so much uh, for uh, joining us and for applying and uh, yeah, without further ado, I guess we're all set for okay. now. Thanks. All right. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so I'm going to take a look at the uh, attendees here. Um, so I do, it's, right. Holly, did you hear anything mm -hmm. back? Um, no. no, unfortunately, all I have is an email address. So I sent in a quick yeah. email to the email address. I have not. Okay. Let me just. Yeah. 
look one more time. I have not received a response to that. So I say we just move on with the, um, you know, the, the next presenter, which was, uh, I believe, the Amherst Cemetery Association, and I believe they are in the audience. There is one person in the audience that was, oh, no longer there. Uh, whose name was Jeff. I don't, I don't see them anymore. So mm -hmm. um, I'm going to bring in the folks for the Amherst Cemetery um, Great. Association and just move forward. Uh, so we have Rebecca Frick, I believe. Rebecca, are you there? Yep. I'm okay. Hi, Rebecca. Hi there. I was afraid oh. I, I I use this Zoom for a lot of different organizations, so I was afraid that it didn't have my name on it, but it does. So. Uh, yes, that happens. Yeah. Um, it's a nice uh, convenience for Zoom, and it's nice with the recordings. Uh, it doesn't have quite the same... Uh, uh, style of in person and one of those is the names that one tries to edit back and forth so um we're all here we received your application and i'd like to uh I'll provide you time as you wish to uh, talk about your application and we uh, may have questions thereafter okay um do i share the slides or don't share slides how does i'm You're welcome to share slides if you wish uh, I'm not certain of the steps to do that. Holly, are you familiar with how to allow Rebecca to share slides? I got it now. Oh, sorry. Yep, you are all set. I said you should be all set. If you're a panelist, you should be able to share screen. It looks like it's working. Okay. Uh, Tim, do you have a question? Uh, you're very soft. I don't know if you have a volume, if you could turn it up a tad, that would be helpful. Thank you, Tim. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to see... I can get back to Zoom. Let me try that. You can just uh, talk very loudly compared okay. to what you normally might. I am. Um... All right. Maybe that helped. That helped. Okay. All right. I'm going to share. Okay. Can you see my screen now? We can. All right. Okay. So my name is Rebecca Fricka. I'm the general manager for Wildwood Cemetery. Um, my office is in the Dickinson, Joseph Dickinson's farmhouse. And Joseph Dickinson was Austin Dickinson's cousin, Emily's cousin. Um, we got a CPA grant to take care of our roof. Well, I actually put in a grant for both the roof and the brick and mortar work, and I was asked to split it uh, into two projects. So we took care of the roof. It looks beautiful. And now I am back with you to ask uh, if you, if the town could help us with the brick and mortar and the chimneys. Um, so I assume you all know where Wildwood is. It's right across the street from the Wildwood Elementary School. We have about 85 acres and uh, we've been in existence since 1887. Um, we think that the farmhouse was built around 1790. We're still doing some research on, on the house, but the Historic Commission has helped me write up an architectural description. We have the Photos were all set with the preservation documentation because of the roof work. Um, we have, uh, we're a non-denominational cemetery. We have been so from the start. 
Um, if you look into the history of it, uh, it involved a lot of very exciting town meetings when they were trying to buy the land for the cemetery association. They, the, the land moved back and forth between the town and the association a couple of times in a short period of time. And then eventually, the after about two years, the Amherst, Associ Amherst Cemetery Association took the land and has been in charge of it ever since. But it always has considered itself a town, very much a town cemetery. We're a nonprofit and... Um, we have monuments of all shapes and sizes. We have street name families. We have uh, BIPOC ind individuals. We have uh, the whole range of society is buried at Wildwood Cemetery. Um, we have uh, over 100 people who are on our notable list and they are notable for all different reasons. Um, we have a lot of authors and artists. We have uh, expert wallpaper hangers. I, I Every now and then I hear something about um, somebody who's buried there. We have a lot of UMass professors, Amherst College professors, Hampshire. So um, we've tried to, uh, since I've come on board six years ago, we have really tried to open up and become a welcoming place for everybody, for lot owners and for uh, the general public. So our masonry, masonry repairs um, are, are uh, extensive. We have four chimneys. Two of them need to be taken down all the way to the, to the roof line, and the other two just need to come down a few layers. Um, we have about 3,000 square feet of masonry work, and you can see that the old mortar is starting to disintegrate and come out between the bricks which then leads them to start popping out. We don't have that happening too much. There's been a lot of repairs over the years, over the decades. And um, we have talked with uh, Robin and Madeline and um, also the bricklayers, and they all agree that it would be better to get rid of the bad patches and do it right uh, consistently across the entire building. Um, we'd also like to reglaze and paint our windows inside and out. They're very, um, they're not the original, well, we have two original pieces of pane glass, um, but I would like to keep the wooden windows that we have. And once we get those fixed up, we're going to hopefully install some uh, storm windows that are wooden. Uh, right now, there's really ugly metal uh, storm windows that are in terrible shape, and I'd like to get take replace those. And um, we're looking to replace our hardware uh, fixtures and repaint. We had the building used to have shutters. We have some pictures of of it with shutters, and we still have all the old shutters, and we'd like to use those again. And here's some pictures of the chimneys and the poor patches. And you can see on the left-hand picture, we do have a few bricks that are popping out, but mostly it's just really bad patching. And under the middle picture, you can see um, the brickwork is starting to fail under that chimney. And you can see the chimney is leaning. So we have um, this budget, and as I said, I applied for a um, CPA grant for that was twice this cost, um, and so I split it in half, and so this is the second half. Um, we do have a donation that would, could go towards the exterior hardware improvements and some landscaping, um, and um, that's the Wildwood contribution. And so the total would be 102, 520. Um, as I said, oh, so um, we were able to put together our Friends of Wildwood Cemetery 501c3 because technically we're a 501c13, which is the cemetery status. We are in the process of trying to register as a historic site, but it's a long process. And I've worked on, I don't know how many, uh, 
different editions, but I'm getting closer, I think, to being able to be reviewed by the state. Um, we are right now leading in the green initiatives. Um, we're providing green burials uh, for uh, uh, Amherst and the surrounding towns. Um, we're doing a lot more pollinator friendly planting and landscaping. Um, we're encouraging the public, as I said, to use the grounds for quiet recreation. We have quite a nice trail system that uh, doesn't include the cemetery. So a lot of people come and walk every day. And um, I tell all the lot owners and everybody I meet that they should just come and enjoy the grounds while they're above ground. That's my, <laughs> um, and um, we're trying now to uh, design some programming and I have a, a poster that's open to the public. We had more, uh, 60 plus people come to our bagpipe stroll, which was a lot of fun. And when we have these events, I open the farmhouse and people can you go inside and use the bathroom. Um, we did a death cafe that actually had quite a long waiting list. So we're going to do another one and we're going to have a winter solstice in December. So, and we have our spring planning uh, is in process now. And I hope that we'll have more and more people coming to the cemetery to appreciate the grounds, the building and our history. So I think that's, that's it. Thank you, Rebecca, uh, for sharing uh, your presentations and slides. I'd like to uh, open up the uh, meeting to committee members for any questions or comments. Uh, Matt. Thank you, Rebecca. And I, I, a friend of mine had actually mentioned Wildwood as a, as a place of uh, green burial. So I, I congratulate you on that and on the community outreach. I think that's wonderful. Um, so, uh, I was just taking a look two years ago cycle, you had the, the roof and the chimneys. I'm not sure if you had asked for money for the, the repointing of the brickwork at that time. Yes. Yes. It did include oh, that. That was included. Yeah. Cause uh, maybe, maybe I looked at the wrong numbers cause the number I saw you originally had asked for 140,000 and it was about 90,000 for the roof. Um, uh, well, I think there were several additions to those asks. It got whittled down, but um, ah. yeah, the, and um, the quote that I got from the first brick, the two brick layers at that point, uh, they had broken out the chimneys and the siding. So maybe right. you're seeing just one of those quotes because originally I did okay. want everything. Yeah. Okay. So what is your annual maintenance budget right now? Um, it's about $24,000. So we're, um, we but are, that, that covers, that covers all the grounds work as well. That's the grounds work. Yes. Yeah. That's the maintenance budget. So it doesn't include right. the staffing. Yeah. And, and it, but it, it, it doesn't, it's not specifically only for the buildings. Oh, it's for the entire place. Right. Yeah. Yes. We are a nonprofit. Um, we have for, I think, as long as it's been in existence, have tried to stay uh, accessible to everybody. If we were right now, uh, cemeteries rely on um, burial fees and lot sales for its income. And our uh, most expensive lot right now is uh, 1750 and I think if we were to charge what it actually costs, it would be around ten thousand um, dollars. But we we can't do that. Um, we just can't do that to people. So we're we're even if it was a sliding scale. Well, we have we have talked about that, and at this point, we're we're starting to inch up on our prices. It's just hard trying to stay, you know, accessible for everybody. Right, but I think you also have to try and cover your cover your maintenance costs. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, we're we're working on it. Um, we have when I came on six years ago, we had quite the deferred maintenance list, so we're we're chipping away at it. 
Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Matt. Rebecca, uh, Jason. Thank you, uh, Rebecca. In your proposal overview, you state that the there's a one bedroom um, apartment on the second floor of the building. Yes. Is that occupied an occupied apartment, or is that yes. just an apartment sitting vacant? No, it's occupied. Okay, so you receive rental income from that apartment yes. then. Yes. Okay. Um, how just out of curiosity, how does that work when you have a private person living there and you're having public? So the first floor is used as the office, the basement storage, and then you have a private residence on the second floor. Yeah, they have their own entrance, and we we don't have. I mean, they they moved in knowing that they were moving into a cemetery, so uh, they they are prepared <laughs> for this. <laughs> Mm -hmm. and that person's not like a caretaker or anything no 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 it's a lot just... of people think i live there but i i don't <laughs> i get to yeah. go home <laughs> all right okay um so does that impact does does the you're asking to reglaze the windows i assume it's the entire building then the second windows. floor windows are all replaced with new windows i'm not sure when that happened but those don't need work okay so just the first floor windows yeah okay thank you uh, Robin. Thank you. Hi, Rebecca. Nice to Hi. see you again. Um, I was just going to, um, this is more of a comment than a question. Uh, I know that uh, Rebe when Rebecca and I met, I think we talked about the um, Massachusetts uh, Public Project Fund uh, would be a possibility for a grant application. Um, their grant cycle starts around now and uh, with information sessions and I think um, awards are made sometime in the spring. So um, uh, just wanted to put that on your radar and I can send you some more uh, information um, to see because it seems like this would be a good um, a good opportunity to make a um, an inquiry there and see if that's a, an avenue to go in. Definitely. Um, it's interesting to see your outreach. I just have an aside, which is I attended Amherst schools growing up in town, including the middle school, which is now the, uh, or what used to be called the junior high, which is now the middle school. And they, it was a less strict environment at that time. And there were a series of classes uh, called BPS self-study science units. And there was a teacher known to all the kids, uh, Mr. Bazo, and he was a bird expert. And he taught not just by the Peterson's book guide, but we regularly toured Wildwood Cemetery. Uh, and I distinctly remember being in there listening for yellow warblers. And there was the Kingfisher by the pond on the way in. And at that time in Amherst, we he actually allowed me and one of these a few other kids and to just go there on our own during double periods and wander Wildwood Cemetery. Now that could never be allowed today, but I bring this up to indicate that there is a lot of that there are a lot of birds to be heard and seen in that location. Uh, and I don't think Mr. Bazo is with us anymore, but there might be some other folks. And I have to say, if he was able to get kids genuinely interested, not simply because they were exiting the school building, um, it's a potential uh, activity for outreach. Um, you know, they were, yeah. particularly in the back lower right, we would... Yeah. You know, flickers, all kinds of different birds. And uh, it, I remember it to this day, distinctly walking through there with a very positive vibe, uh, just an aside. Yeah, we, did, we do have, um, this past spring, we had two bird groups come through and I generally walk with them. Uh, and then between birding, bird sites, sighting, I, I give them some history. Um, we're actually... We just got a restricted donation for uh, tree and shrub planting. And I just met with somebody. We are hoping to plant some more low lying because when you were going through the woods, 
the trees were shorter and I guess you could see the birds better. And now the trees have really matured and it's much harder to see the birds migrating through. So um, it's been suggested that we do some more low uh, planting for that purpose. Uh, yeah, it sounds interesting. And there was a lot, it was like audio. We would hear them first and hone in on them. Yeah, yeah. One. Uh, Bob. Um, since the chairman has opened up the floor to interesting um, observations, I want to know if, let's say, CPAC members had recently purchased a plot in Wildwood Cemetery, is it necessary to recuse ourselves from this discussion? I would think not. Good. <laughs> No, and I don't think you would need to if you had uh, relatives buried there either. <laughs> Just if you're living in the apartment, Bob. <laughs> um, any additional questions or comments from committee members? I do want to say, uh, Robin and I have been in discussion, and I am looking for other sources of income. Um, I think... Uh, there's always seems to be one thing like that we don't the a standard we don't meet. But I'm I'm actively looking. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I appreciate, uh, and I'm sure committee members do. You're taking the time to uh, seek out uh, funding uh, from CPA and other places, and to submit an application for us. Um, I appreciate your taking the time to be here. Uh, and for what you do, uh, and it's it's certainly a, a nice uh, location uh, uh, and kind of tranquil, actually. Uh, so we may have questions for you, um, in which case we would email you. Uh, and also, if you have other comments or anything you want to add, certainly provide them to Holly and myself. We'll make sure they go to the committee. Uh, we're apt to have a public hearing on an annual public hearing, which is required on the oh. 5th of December, which is an opportunity for oh. the public to comment. And thereafter, we commence with deliberations. Uh, you've been through this process recently, so you have some familiarity. Uh, but I just thought I'd remind you. So thank you so much. Oh. And let me just make sure... No one else has their hands up. I do see a. Okay, so uh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, for all the work that you do to make this happen. Thank you. Thank now, I do see that Madeline Helmer is in the uh, participant audience list. So I'm going to. Yeah, I got it, Sam. Go, wonderful. We can invite Madeline in. Hello. Let me get my video. Oh. Hello, Madeline. Can you hear us? Yes. Sorry. Um, thanks for the nudge. I could not make it until now. Well, I'm glad that you uh, responded to Holly's inquiry and we're here. We're all certainly busy of late um, for a variety of reasons. Uh, so we received your application. We sent some questions. I know you responded. We wanted to give you an opportunity to uh, present anything you wish. Uh, and we we may or may not have questions as well. So thank you for uh, joining us. Yes, thank you. Um, thanks for considering this application. Um, this, so this is to fund a his, uh, historic resources survey of 20th century um, buildings in Amherst. Um, uh, so the last survey of historic buildings in Amherst was conducted in 1988. And so at that time, it only considered properties that were historic then. So those are properties built prior to 1938. So Amherst has, you know, so, so many um, properties that were built in the 20th century um, and that are now historic and that are now considered um, by the Historical Commission when we um, 
make our determinations for um, demolition delays and um, which includes alterations and um, um, dem and demolitions of, of properties. So these properties are coming before us um, and we really just need a metric for how to evaluate them. So to do, to start that, we, we really want to um, conduct a survey of a limited um, number of properties, but something that would give us a good sense of the, the building fabric that we have, which is um, various institutional buildings, um, many sort of residential developments. And so we would have some neighborhood um, forms as well. And these are all the MHC forms, um, so the Massachusetts Historical Commission forms, and all of that material would be uploaded to a public database, the MACRIS database, which is um, Massachusetts Historical Commission's, um, the State Historic Preservation Office's database. So that would be publicly available knowledge. Um, and yes, um, we would not consider um, uh, college or properties at this point, just um, because those are pretty well known and um, um, well studied at this point, although they are part of our heritage as well. But we would focus our efforts on the things that we don't know too much about at this point. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> um... Any questions or comments from committee members? And I should say that this this funding would um, fund a separate consultant to, oh. to do the, the survey work. I have a question and I asked it uh, of you in written form as well. Um, there are quite a lot of houses in Amherst uh, that were built during that time period. Um, and I, I, it seems as though you might have a challenge because there's so many to consider uh, surveying uh, and identifying the few uh, that you'll be able to or the, or the group. Uh, do you anticipate having further needs for studies right now you're looking to bring in a consultant to do that but uh, would you expect that this might be an ongoing need uh, or is there do you anticipate a highlighted group yeah i think we have um so i don't think we need to survey well this would be um a beginning and i think it would uh, the aim would be to really understand the types in Amherst, so not necessarily um, have a granular level detail on every de neighborhood's history, but just to understand the types of um, properties and what makes them significant, what, what we have in town, and uh, so that we can understand sort of what are those building types that are that are worth preserving that are um, and those that are just very common that um, wouldn't make them as, as significant if they come before us, the, the commission. And, and do you need uh, any form of permission from the homeowners uh, to conduct surveys? No, it consists of an exterior photo or two, you know, several photos from the right of way. And then a um, a write up of the the architectural description of the exterior, and then a description of the um, properties. It's a narrative of the property's significance and its history, um, but you don't need permission. And I did receive this question previously um, regarding whether it there's any. Um, preservation kind of restrictions through this and there isn't there's we understand that by being in the survey doesn't mean there's additional um, protections for a property 
In fact, we're including some properties that we know are going to be redeveloped so that we can record them and understand them just so that we know what we have right now, what the building fabric of Amherst includes. Um, Robin. I think Jason has had his hand up before me. Sorry, right, go ahead. Okay. Um, I just a follow up to what Madeline was saying um, that as part of the survey, you can do something called an individual building form or an area form. So an area form, uh, indiv an individual building form would cover a specific property very specifically. Area forms can, um, per, you know, especially for housing developments, like, you know, um, just to sit, you know, off the top of my head, like a place like Echo Hill, um, would cover the entire development. Um, so covering a lot of different properties under one umbrella, you get a lot more, um, more of an overview and not a specific um, uh, house by house necessarily representation. And I think that we would expect that this survey would have um, area forms as well as individual forms to kind of help bring the numbers in without, again, getting down to that granular detail, so. Right. You're muted, Sam. Uh, Jason? Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, Madeline, you mentioned that you wouldn't be doing any uh, university or college buildings, but I see the Hillel House and the Morgan House are institutional, and I believe one is on Amherst College and one is UMass. Is there a reason why those were included? And then my second question is, uh, and you may have already answered this, but Fort River is going to be demolished. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, you know, and then Wildwood, I don't know if we know what the fate of Wildwood is going to be yet, but um, is there a reason then to include Fort River knowing that now that it's going to be demolished and is that just the recording of what was there? And what then is the significance of that? Yeah, that's actually something we recommend um, when a property comes before the Historical Commission and we we understand that it will be demolished, but we it's good to have a record of the the property um, as as an understanding of the history of our of our built environment. So yeah, because it's gonna be demolished, that's actually maybe a reason to to record it now um, so that we know sort of, it represents uh, architecture of that era and it was significant to the town. And uh, to answer your questions about the institutional buildings, um, I will note those down. And this is a draft um, list. So we, if those properties have been um, researched and recorded already, then they wouldn't be in the in the survey. Thank you. Uh any other questions or comments uh, from committee members? Uh, anything you'd like to add, uh, Madeline? Um, no, I think this is just something that uh, many communities in Massachusetts are doing now to just document their 20th century buildings um, because there was such a big effort in the 80s to record properties. And so now we have and there was so much development that occurred in the 20th century. And and we do have um, some really interesting um, mid-century modern buildings as well and um, developments it would be great to know more about. Um, but thanks for your time, everybody. And I'm, I apologize for um, my tardiness, but thanks so much for listening. Uh, thank you. Uh, we're glad that you were able to join us, uh, uh, even in a new time slot. Uh, I'm glad that we were able to get that uh, 
get you in front of us today. Uh, if we have further questions, we'll certainly contact you. Uh, and if there's something additional you wish to add, certainly let uh, Holly and myself know and we'll forward it to the committee. Uh, we have an annual public hearing on December 5th, where or it's currently slated for that time, where we enable um, the public as part of the CPA state process to inquire on any of the projects. And thereafter, we uh, commence with our deliberations as a committee. Uh, so we appreciate your taking the time to complete an application um, and for taking the time to come here uh, in the middle of a busy week. Uh, thank you so much. And we'll uh, be in touch as we follow up. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Uh, so that concludes, as a committee, our uh, final presentation of the evening. I don't have any topics that I did not reasonably anticipate uh, 48 hours before the meeting. So I would like to uh, adjourn the meeting at 7.48 p.m. Uh, thank you all for coming, and uh, we'll see you next week. Thank you. Thanks, Sam. Good night. Thanks, Sam. Good night.